if I'm not judging John Anderson, then I'm not really interested in what you're saying. I'm quite indifferent to what you're communicating. But when I judge you, when I kind of assess your comments as being good or bad, then I'm actually listening to you. And that's how human relationships are forged. That's how we become part of a public career. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Frank Ferrudi back for the second time, one of my very early uh, conversationalists. He's a scholar, a commentator, author of some 25 books, uh, emeritus professor of sociology at the University of Kent in Canterbury in the United Kingdom. His work covers a vast scope of topics, uh, race, welfare, therapy, culture, the state of the universities, national borders, parenting, fear culture, and now most recently, our modern obsession with identity and identity politics and its very real dangers. His most recent book, released uh, uh, just about the time that I'm recording this, is 100 Years of Identity Crisis, Culture War Over Socialization. And it will be the main topic of our conversation in this instance, although we'll touch on other issues, uh, government responses to COVID, the state of our universities, uh, and how fear is blinding us to the opportunities before us. If you're ready, I thought we'd kick off with this issue of moral engineering and what William Thomas, who you quote, what he said. Well, I, I think it's very interesting because uh, I never heard of moral engineering as a concept. And then when I began to look into the uh, issue of socialization in great detail, I began to realize that uh, in the 18th and the 19th century, what you and I call child rearing or socialization used to be called moralization. And what it was really all about was, was the uh, attempt to transmit certain uh, moral norms to young people about what is right and what is wrong and how to behave. But then what happens is that at a certain point, uh, traditional morality is called into question. People are, are saying that it's no longer relevant to the modern era. And I think at that point, what you have is a kind of uh, attempt to engineer these, what I call administratively created uh, moral norms. And moral engineering, in a sense, uh, is, is really a, a project whereby you try to distance young people from the values of their elders, from the values of their community and of their traditions. And instead of, uh, of transmitting those values, you expose them to what the moral engineers, which are, is really a species of social engineers, think is important. Yes, you actually quote, uh, you know, quite chilling from William Thomas, an earlier 20th century American sociologist. He said that once we have a science of rational control, then, and I'm quoting again, we can establish any attitudes and values we like whatsoever. Uh, this is really pretty chilling and plays, I suspect, to the suspicions that a lot of parents have that there are a lot of forces in our educational and academic and even media circles that are attempting to do just that, to strip the parents uh, of the socialization responsibilities and I would say uh, um, privileges of raising their children. I think so. I think that uh, over the last hundred years, you can see the tendency towards displacing education with indoctrination becoming stronger and stronger. And although now and again you find parents resisting this, you find people speaking out against this, you'll find that as the decades go by and as communities uh, become a little bit weaker, their, their idea of solidarity and their commitment to moral values mm. Uh, diminishes a little bit, so the indoctrination element becomes more and more important in education. We have a, a more extreme version of what uh, what this uh, sociologist was talking about, because today we have a situation where in many schools in England or America, they teach young people that uh, whiteness is a problem, that white people should check their privilege, uh, that you as a white boy or a white girl should defer to others who are not white because in some shape or form your ancestors bear the burden of historical guilt. You have a situation 
but which I find particularly disturbing, where very often you have teachers tell children not to tell uh, their, their parents what they've been discussing about gender and sex and uh, about the fact that there's, you know, that sex, sex and men and women aren't just simply biological, but are constructed socially. And therefore, we have to be open to the idea that there are many, many genders. And I've uh, talked to numerous parents who discover one, one, one afternoon that their children has been discussing these things. And these are very young children, six, seven, eight or nine, uh, being indoctrinated into a worldview that is very different than those of their parents. To, um, I recently spoke with Abigail Shira on this, and what's really interesting, of course, is that when it comes to gender dysphoria, uh, if it were really science and data-based, you would expect the same sort of patterns to emerge regardless of colour or class or economic well-being, but in fact, the explosion in the number of children presenting with dysphoria turns out to be very much concentrated in middle and upper class American white families, daughters of middle and upper class white families, which tells you straight away that there must be all sorts of societal uh, and cultural practices actually inducing this rather than it being something that can be verified by the data and by science and by reason. Yeah, I think it's interesting. If you look at this uh, question in the, over the long term, you'll find that all these innovations in, in values to do with sex and gender and human behavior first kick in in the elite schools, usually the elite private schools in the Anglo-American world. That's really where they first become popularized. And then over the decades, they gradually seep down into uh, the rest of society. And that's really how these things work. And I think what you'll find is that uh, uh, very often in, in schools, all you need to do, have is two or three children uh, coming from a, a relatively affluent uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, fairly uh, sort of uh, culturally uh, enriched families who decide, for example, that it's uh, really cool to cut their arms and, and, and cut themselves. And then it just gets completely, you know, you have an epidemic of kids in that school cutting themselves. And similarly with trans culture, all you need is two or three kids saying, uh, I'm a boy living in a girl's body uh, before other boys begin to come out and say, I too have certain uh, sort of similar, similar attitudes and, and I too want to identify as, as a girl. And I think that, that uh, kind, of, uh, kind of copycat effect in these schools is, is really quite striking. And, and there are numerous examples of uh, that kind of... Uh, give you evidence about how this really kind of works. Yeah, it seems to me that one of the things that uh, has come with this identity crisis where it seems that these days, instead of saying, for example, I think, therefore I am, we say, I feel, therefore I am. And you talk about this in the book, uh, this concept of um, the enormous difficulty of finding your own identity and that very few people do it satisfactorily. Perhaps part of the problem is that Young girls particularly, we know, particularly need affirmation, but all young people do. And the way to get affirmation seems to be to go online, say I'm a victim, I'm trapped in the wrong body, or I'm uncertain about whatever, and the affirmation pours in. It's a way to really be affirmed and to be told how fantastic you are for standing up and so forth. Uh, you know, I wonder whether it doesn't in fact lead to further confusion down the road. Yes, but even before this, there's a big problem because uh, we know that uh, the way that young people successfully overcome their identity crisis is one of three ways, either through what they achieve. So the fact that they've achieved something in, in the world, they've, they really kind of master the language. They, they've become very good at pottery. You know, they've been they've been really good at uh, uh, in, at their job. That achieve, sense of achievement gives people a strong sense of who they are. Secondly, I think it's it's done through action, the way you kind of make an impact on the world, the quality of the relationships you're able to establish for yourself. And finally, and most importantly, his, the identity crisis is overcome through having a strong sense of vocation, a sense of purpose about who you are. You know, what is it that uh, you want to do in, in the world? What makes you uh, 
uh, in a sense, uh, a, a person. And and what, what do you want to do with yourself? What is what, what is the goal and objective of your life? And these three elements that are critical for for identity formation are all discouraged in our education system, because in our education system we tend to displace these uh, accomplishments with a, a what I call the psychology of validation, where you argue that the way you give kids strong identity is by giving them smiley faces, is by telling them how good they are, by raising their self-esteem, by making them feel good. And, and there's this kind of bizarre notion that I making you feel good is somehow going to give you the confidence to be able to overcome your identity crisis rather than make you dependent, which is what it does. It makes you dependent on the recognition of others. So you become entirely powerless to make your own way in the world as a result of this. And on this, uh, that sounds, you know, reasoned, rational, based in evidence, based in history, dare I say. Now, in your book, you use the word scientism a lot. And I found this quite interesting because my understanding of scientism is, is something like this. You turn the scientific method into an absolute measure of what we can know and even of what exists. But you use it in a slightly different and really interesting way as, and I'm quoting here, an ideology that inappropriately politicizes science and undermines cultural norms. Again, another quote. Can you tell us what you mean um, in this very interesting term as you use it, scientism, how it undermines cultural norms? You've just touched on it, but can you elaborate a bit more on where you see that taking us? Yes, I, th I think that scientism became an ideology in a sense. Uh, and the way that it works is that it basically argues that uh, human relationships, for example, between men and women, between parents and children, are, are not really relationship as much as something that you can measure, you can, uh, you can uh, identify as a skill. And that science uh, and experts, particularly psychologists, are much better at, the, uh, at, at, the, at mediating these relationships and conducting those relationships than ordinary human beings. So what you have increasingly is that science, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the form of scientism, moves into areas uh, that have got nothing to do with uh, real scientific investigation, but are really uh, touching on, on areas that used to be considered to be moral, uh, the, uh, the field of morality, about what is right and what is wrong, what is a good behavior, how we should, uh, how we should talk to each other. Uh, you have these kind of uh, scientific experts moving in. So today we have a situation where you have parenting experts, you have uh, well-being experts, you have coaches that tell you you know, how to go to a job interview, coaches that tell you how to interact with your colleagues. And in a sense, it, uh, on the one hand, dispossesses you and I of our ability to conduct our, our, our lives independently. But more importantly, it kind of, it kind of uh, in, the, in the neutral language of science, it kind of conveys ideological norms that are actually quite uh, mystified. Because basically what it does is that science in the form of scientism becomes a, a, a conduit for, 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 for uh, promoting and circulating norms and ideals that uh, are actually political in many respects and very often uh, sort of moral. But we're not aware of that because we're, we're told that what, 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 this is what science says rather than what I, as I see in accordance with a different political view than, than what you have. Well, to, to lead on then again, um, you know, you'd have to say all the evidence suggests to us uh, that uh, this isn't actually working out very well for young people. I, I, you know, Australia is no exception, but the levels of anxiety, of depression, of self-harm and so forth amongst young people is, is really, it ought to be causing responsible policymakers everywhere to, and as well as parents to say, we've got a problem. Let's look at the facts. But um, what I find interesting is that you wrote... Um, uh, uh, it is a detachment from moral norms that has lent identity an unstable, arbitrary and fluid form. The decisive influence is a lack of clarity about the moral values that underpin the self. Now, you and I belong to an age that, you know, we've lived through the decline of an old moral order. It's been pretty roundly rejected. It's an extraordinary sort of flipping of so many of the old verities that you and I lived under, uh, we see the emergence of a new one. 
What's different about morality today that makes identity so uncertain? And, and how does this tie in with the rise of this identity politics uh, uh, movement? I think there are uh, two aspects to this. I think that uh, as morality um, becomes sidelined and where people are, uh, are put under pressure to avoid speaking a moral language, and very often we make fun of people who use a, a traditional moral discourse as, as being somehow old fashioned or completely out of it. That's how it's perceived. So children, as they grow up in the world and also adults, are frequently told the message, there is no such thing as right and wrong. I don't know if you heard that expression. Oh, very much so. Little John and little Mary are instructed, oh, there is no such thing as a right and wrong. Uh, and, and the more you hear this, the more you begin to become confused about you know, what it is that, that uh, you should be aiming towards. And this, uh, this, this language, uh, uh, this kind of moral engineering that we have is, is also one which, instead of giving you clarity, uses a, uses a very opaque vocabulary. So very often when you, when you, when you talk to uh, experts, parenting experts and other kind of experts uh, to do with human relationships, they basically say, this is inappropriate, right? Or this yeah. is problematic. Now, the word inappropriate is very interesting because it doesn't mean that it's wrong, right? It doesn't say, don't do it, this is wrong. You're told this is inappropriate. And that could mean a whole lot of different things. And therefore, a child that's uh, told that their behavior is inappropriate is left you know, to kind of figure out, you know, what am I supposed to be doing what did I do that was wrong? What did I do that was right? And what happens is that as young people make their way in the world, you know, the, uh, the kind of grounding in a, in, in a clear set of moral norms is, is eroded. And therefore, what they're left with is a situation where they have to almost rely entirely on the advice uh, of, uh, of, of the people that are around them. And it's usually a, a psychological advice, where they, where they essentially are told that what really matters is, 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 your, uh, is, is, is that you need to be emotionally uh, in control, you need to be emotionally literate, you've got to come to terms with your emotions. They're kind of forced inwards to kind of uh, obsess about their self to the point at which you know, it becomes very difficult under those circumstances for young people to have a clear sense of what their life should really be about, how they should relate. And I think that kind of confusion means that uh, by the time you're 18 or 19, you, you do become you know, slightly obsessed with your identity. That's why you have young people going from one identity to another. That is why they feel so defensive uh, when they're put under pressure, because from their point of view, if I criticize you, no, they don't say, oh, you're criticizing my arguments or my ideas. Their arguments and their ideas are inextricably linked with their self. So if I criticize you, I'm actually criticizing you as a human being rather than your ideas. It becomes, a, a, from, from their point of view, a kind of annihilation of the self, which is why being offended is so important, why people take you know, such umbrage at people who make a joke at their expense. They don't say, oh, you made a joke at my expense, I'll make a joke at your expense. They see that as a kind of assault on their very humanity. And I think that's really where you have this kind of fragility being so powerful uh, in the Anglo-American world, which in a sense stays with people into their 20s and into their 30s. It's very interesting. Um, it's 20 years now since 9-11, and I recall I was actually acting prime minister in Australia because our prime minister was in America. It was only a mile from where the plane ploughed into the Pentagon in Washington when it all happened. And uh, I remember George Bush in that very blunt language that he sometimes used, uh, sort of almost OK Corral stuff, um, talking of, um, uh, the, you know, the, of good and evil. And the French foreign minister at the time uh, making a, a, a very blunt rebuttal. What is this American talk of good and evil? We sophisticated Europeans gave up believing in such uh, archaic notions long ago. There's only great. It, it doesn't work, though, does it? Because I think intrinsically the reality is that all human beings are actually highly moral. As a friend of mine says, if you doubt that, 
join the mafia and steal the boss's silver and see what happens. It's a question of whose morality and how it's shaped. And what you're really painting is a picture of, um, of, of a sea of uncertainty, parents and traditional norms being discarded, and what you call, I think, um, an expertocracy, what others might call a technocracy, a technocr technocratic class, sort of trying to shape these things. And it's in the incredible thing about it is there's two incredible aspects of it to me. One is that it's incredibly confusing because it constantly moves. You know, the fashions change. Uh, you know, the activists 20 years ago, after, uh, after 10 years ago, were were busily occupy, occupy Wall Street, protesting against the banking and the wealth uh, mal distribution and so forth that so troubled them during the great financial crisis. Now the left is closely allied with business in many cases because both of them are endlessly talking about the politics of identity politics, in particular race uh, and, and, and sexual politics. You know, So you've got this extraordinary activist and big business and especially high tech coming together. But it's very fluid, very confusing, and we don't know what they actually want. What's the end goal? What sort of cultural house are they trying to build to replace the one that they're busily burning down? Well, I think it's an interesting question. I struggle with this question because uh, uh, when you look deeply, you'll find that they themselves are morally disoriented. And although they are beginning to forge together a, a l'esprit de corps, so that, for example, if you have a dinner party, then the head of Netflix and the head of Google and the head of the Bank of America and other cultural entrepreneurs will know exactly how to respond to a particular question. They all look at each other and they, and they think that in the same kind of a way. And for example, if I open my mouth at that dinner party and I say something, they will all have this look of disapproval on their faces because they think alike. But uh, they're struggling at the moment to give clarity to that. They haven't developed a, a system of morality. And in the book, I call what they possess an ideology without a name in the sense that there's a system of ideas that they all subscribe to. But it hasn't really uh, sort of mutated into uh, a clear system of ideas. I think the way to understand the way this works is to be very, very sensitive whenever you hear one of them or a group of them talk about the need to raise awareness. I think awareness is, is the key, key word in their cultural and political vocabulary. Because when you talk about awareness, what they're saying is that we got to make people uh, understand something that is not yet part of the social conversation. We got to make people uh, aware of something that I and you and a few select oligarchs uh, grasp, but the rest of the society is too insensitive to understand it. And when you talk about raising awareness, what they're really saying is you want people to think the way that we think. Right? That's what they're really getting at. We know the truth, but you don't. So you better adopt our uh, vision of the world. And I think that kind of uh, raising awareness scenario, which, which, which is something that happens in institutions, in schools, in all domains of, of, of uh, uh, political and cultural experience, is, is, is one of the main ways in which uh, human morality in our societies is influenced and shaped and, and, uh, and exploited to some extent. But, they, but they, you know, to go back to my earlier illustration, the point is it changes so rapidly. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, Wall Street was the problem. Now Wall Street's sort of part of the solution because they all agree, as you say. And this is very dangerous, as you uh, rightly, I think, are trying to warn us. Uh, very dangerous for the essential, if you like, universalism that underpins freedom, the understanding that everybody's views ought to be taken into account because everyone has worth and dignity. This is starting to look a little to me like the build up to the French Revolution, where you've got unholy alliances between sorts of the new clerisy, the new aristocracy, um, business class activists, politicians, academia, uh, and the great bulk, the middle classes that we used to recognise as being so critical. And a middle class that was educated, engaged, committed to their neighbours, that is being eaten out 
But at the same time, the, environment's being, the environment is being set for a terrible backlash, not least of all economically, I suspect, because asset-owning people are, you know, I'm a free enterprise man myself, very much so, but I think what we've got now is a sort of crony capitalism emerging. Those who have wealth are hanging on to it and becoming wealthier. Those who don't, particularly young people, can't get their first foot on the ladder. So you put all of this together, this sort of incredible arrogance at the top, uh, and uh, the fact that they seem to be protected and they want everybody else not only to be uh, you know, increased in their awareness, but also the, the subplot is pay the price for our policies. Get used to being a peasant again. Yeah, and, and, and there are deep divisions that have uh, been created on, on, on the back of this. And I always notice that in Europe, you have a, a section of society that is very comfortable with the lockdown, for example. They think that, okay, it's, it, it's a bit, bit of a hassle. We can do international travel as much as we did in the past. But by and large, you know, not having to go into the office, you know, having more free time is okay. But they don't actually think of the fact that there are millions of people who run our infrastructure, millions of people who are working in the supply chain, millions of people that are working in shops, you know, who haven't got the luxury of staying at home and and kind of uh, you know sort of doing pottery or, or or going for long walks. So there's a kind of two world situation that's being created uh, on the back of this, and it isn't just simply an economic or a or a political division. It's also a very cult very powerful cultural division because they really look down upon the attitudes of people who are working in the supply chain. They look down upon the people who work in shops or you know, in, in kind of what used to be called traditional working class uh, sort of uh, domains of the economy. And it seems to me that, you know, when you, when you talk, when you, when, you, when you see the situation, you have the recipe for a very segregated, segmented society uh, becoming harder and harder and you know, all the time. You've written very convincingly, I was particularly struck by an article uh... Uh, on the book Borders uh, that you'd written, a book about borders that appeared in uh, Australia earlier this year because you touched on Australia Day. But um, this, it seems that part and parcel of clearing the way for those who say we know best is to delegitimise the past. And you talk about it. Um, if you delegitimise the past, you delegitimise the present. Uh, and... Um, you leave young people particularly feeling that they are the inheritors of a bad culture and they're not prepared to understand, uh, dig into it, understand where their freedoms came from, what the alternatives might be. They just feel it was bad, so we've got to move on. And you, you cite examples, the 1619 Project in America. I mean, its author doesn't claim that it's accurate history. Extraordinary. Uh, in Australia, objections to Australia Day, move the date, uh, and all the rest of it designed to make young people feel that they're inheriting something that's illegitimate. A full-scale review uh, in, in Britain and America in particular, of which sat statues ought to be allowed to remain, uh, landmarks should be removed and what have you. Uh, how does this move um, get played in your view? Uh, in more, Can you tell us what you think the, the real motivation behind it is? Elaborate a little on your thinking there. Well, I think this is one of the most important uh, developments in the recent decade, uh, this uh, crusade against the past, the attempt to uh, ultimately destroy the legacy of human civilization, because that's what it's really all about, because in many respects, you know, sort of when you, when you, when you explore what people are saying, they basically are saying that uh, the past, by definition, is a, is a morally inferior uh, sort of uh, kind of domain, a, a sphere of, of, of humanity than the present. And I think what they're trying to do is to undermine and call into question uh, the cultural legacy of everything from Judeo-Christian tradition all the way to the Greeks, the Romans, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. Because from their point of view, those views uh, are inherently flawed. And what they're trying to basically uh, create is a situation where the past then becomes uh, blamed for all the ills of today. Somehow we are uh, carrying the burdens of the misdeeds of our ancestors. And the objective of this is to create what I call a year zero history, where essentially we draw a line 
and basically say that things before this behind this line are bad everything that is potentially okay is going to be constructed in the here and now it's a kind of presentist cultural outlook and the tragedy with this is that if we dispossess ourselves of what uh, what what our ancestors have done and and we kind of give up on all the valuable uh, experiences and, uh, and, the, and the valuable contributions that have been made over the centuries, then what we're left with is essentially the uh, advice and the contributions of our contemporary experts. I mean, they get to decide everything about our life. They get to decide everything about moral norms, philosophical norms. They get to decide basically how we ought to behave. And what, they, what, what that would mean is a complete transformation in our, our in, the, in the in the very meaning of what a human being is, because until now our personality, our personhood, was the product of historical experience of of, of you know what we learned from our ancestors. Today, uh, if if you go along with this, who we are as human beings is defined by experts sitting around in a in a committee room and having a discussion about uh, you know. Uh, sort of which boxes to take, you know, you know what kind of human behavior is most consistent with the values that they want to project. So I think it's a very, very dangerous phenomenon, uh, which uh, is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. Which, if it allow, is allowed to continue, will lead to a, a complete uh, implosion in our society. I mean, it is not unlike what happened to a, a different historical moments. To societies when they lost their way totally. I think Rome is a very good example, and it stops believing in itself and literally invites the barbarians to take over. And if we get rid of the past, we literally uh, are demanding that these experts, you know, sort of come over and govern our lives in a way that uh, petty dictators have done in the past. This is, um, uh, you know, you you do this so powerfully because of the, the reach of your intellect and learning. But it's a very interesting crossover here because, I, you know, I, I imagine you would not self-identify as a conservative, and yet it was Edmund Burke who said that I think that life is a is a contract between the dead, the living, and the future, and we've stripped that out. We seem to be insistent that no one who's gone before us had any wisdom at all, and in this country, it extends to universities vigorously resisting the teaching of Western civilization because of its failings. No, it wasn't perfect. But surely in studying the successes as well as the failings, or put it the other way around, the failings as well as the successes, you maximise the chances of finding a good way through. No, it has to be denied in order that people can be putty, if you like, in the technocrats, in the, in, 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 in the hands of uh, the expertocracy, the very point that William Thomas was making, we're going to establish any attitudes and values we want. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is really important because um, you don't need to be an old school conservative to understand the importance of conserving uh, cultural traditions, of conserving a legacy that, uh, that is the product of centuries of, of human experimentation, of human sacrifice. They are the most valuable resources that we have, uh, no matter what your political beliefs are, in, in making your way in the world. You know, uh, you, you, you can't create or build anything of value just by starting from scratch. You, you get up in the morning and you forget that there was a, a human past. You, you can't simply just start anew with nothing uh, in, your, in your head. I mean, that doesn't make very much sense at all. And uh, it seems to me that if we stop uh, taking seriously what we learned through the centuries, then we're left with very little uh, in terms of understanding our own predicament. So in that sense, I think what's what's really uh, what we're really talking about here, this is something that the practitioners of of, of this uh, brutal process of making fun of the past don't understand, is that if you actually carry through that that kind of process, you end up being prisoners of the present. It's a kind of presentism. Yeah, you're kind of cut off from everything that that kind of preceded you, but because you've been cut off from everything that preceded you. You haven't got the capacity to move forward in the future. You haven't got the resources, the moral and the intellectual resources to move confidently into the future. And therefore, you just kind of stay in the present in a kind of uh, 
state of stasis and, and cultural paralysis. And that's really what we're seeing today. And when earlier on you talked about how people are so uh, volatile in terms of the way that ideas change, what we are really talking about is people who are, in a sense, jumping around within the same present space, trying to somehow find some meaning. But you can't really do that unless you have a, you, your eyes are both to the past and, and, and towards the future. That's, what's, that's what makes us really a, an exciting species as human beings, that we have a, a sense of history, a, a sense of, of movement and a capacity to understand that we came from somewhere, but we're also going somewhere a little bit different. And it seems to me, just building on that, I found this part in your book, uh, 100 page 185, um, particularly intriguing, you said, decades before the word snowflake, and our, our listeners and viewers will know what that word means, began to convey the connotation of fragility and vulnerability of our young, it was evident to some prescient observers that techniques of validation encouraged sections of young people to become inward-looking, powerless and confused about their identity. It really struck me that. You know, you're getting all these paradoxes. We talk about making our children more resilient. They're less resilient than ever. Um, are you arguing, uh, it seems to me, if I can pick this point up, that paradoxically, the more we sort of massage our children's egos with the thing that you were talking about earlier, making them feel good about themselves, the more fragile their actual self-esteem will be, the less resilient, the less um, outward-looking uh, and, and, and um, uh, if you like, positive they actually are becoming. Well, look, you don't need to have a PhD in psychology to understand that the more inv investments we make, <clears throat> excuse me, in mental health resources, and the more psychological interventions we make in education over the decades, the more the mental health crisis, as it's called, gets greater and greater. So it's inter interesting and it's almost paradoxical that it's not noticed that despite greater and greater investment in, in psychological intervention, psychological problems seems to increase year on year. And in Australia, as much as in England, you'll find that every month almost, you get a new report that says the mental health crisis amongst children is increasing. You know, you had this re massive reports during the pandemic, a lockdown. Children's mental health is a far bigger problem today than it was last year. And if you go back over the last 30 years, you'll find that every year the same reports come out. They all, you never get a report that says the mental health state of our children has improved. The mental health of Australia is far better than it was five or 10 years ago. You never get that. What you get is that the continuous downbeat, pessimistic assessment of things that are getting worse and worse. And I think there's a correlation between uh, the apparent a decline in well-being and, and, and mental health, uh, the increase of different kind of psychological conditions, and the framing of everyday life in a psychological language. If we introduce psychology as the main medium through which people are, uh, are forced to interpret their experience, if we then tell them that, that, psycho that psychological problems are very real and are likely to affect them, if we also tell them that if you have a psychological issue, you're going to be damaged for life, you're going to be traumatized for life, then it's inevitable that people will be dispossessed of their capacity for resilience. They will be dispossessed of their capacity for autonomy and independence, and instead, they will feel powerless. So I'm not at all surprised that there's a close correlation between the expansion of psychology and interest in providing resources for mental health and the intensification of mental health problems. Uh, makes sense to me, I have to say, but that doesn't make it anything any less worrying. Can I ask you, the role the universities have played uh, in the rise of a society in which democracy seems somehow increasingly subordinated to a technocracy or a, 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 an expertocracy that seems to want to reduce many really complex issues. The last time you and I spoke, we talked about Freedoms, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, freedom to act in accordance with your conscience, freedom of religion. But now we have responses to COVID, uh, all these new claims about gender identity. They're all being somehow, it seems to me, dissolved into medical or health issues as part of this, you have to feel good about yourself, even as we feel less good about ourselves. 
Yes, I mean, I think what, what you're describing is the medicalization of everyday life. So basically, what has happened is that uh, ordinary, normal problems that you and I have in the course of making our way in the world, the kind of pain and distress and disappointment that we sometimes feel by being rejected or by failing, which is part of the human conditions, have been recast in a psychological language. So for every existential problem, you now have a, a psychological diagnosis. So as a result of that, you know, if you go into a room and you feel uncomfortable, but shy, you're not shy, you got social phobia. You know, and if you, for some reason, you know, sort of uh, feel a little bit uncomfortable about leaving home, you know, during the COVID uh, crisis, then you got this uh, re-entry, what they call re-entry syndrome that you're suffering from. And all that it is, it's just a bit wary of doing something that you haven't done for a while. So when you have the reinterpretation of uh, ordinary, normal existential problems in a medical vocabulary, then you're almost incited to feel weak, fragile, you're almost incited to feel sick as a result of that. And I think that this, this is a, a very big problem because it both makes, feel, make, makes us feel weak but also it distracts us from understanding, um, you know, sort of what are the, the moral values? You know, what are the values that we want to live by? It's, in the book, I call this a crisis of normativity, where basically uh, philosophical and moral norms, which are central for giving us directions, are replaced by medical categories and psychological diagnosis. It seems to me, and, and uh, you, you, you write about this, um, that uh, we're increasingly living in, uh, living in an age uh, in which safety has become the main virtue of society. Now, we know that, you know, something like COVID, the initial reaction of fear means that people will flee for security at the price of freedom in the short term. But we now seem to live in an age where we almost cower in fear in the corner in the face not only of the real challenges that do beset us, and they're, and they're manifold and I don't want to belittle them, we do face major challenges, but if we're going to cower in the corner, there was a fascinating story in um, one of the weekend magazines here about a, 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 an extraordinary rise in the young, number of young men in Australia seeking vasectomies because they've never had children and they don't, don't want to bring them into the world. It's such an ugly and frightening and uncertain place. Uh, that's a That's a a fearful position, I think, to adopt, um, and it seems to be to be manifest, you know. But even in the face of the good news, we're not allowed to celebrate that longevity is way up around the world. Uh, we've managed one way or another to lift vast numbers of people out of poverty. Education is much more widely spread, and and and, and there's not much of a disparity right across the globe now. Some countries, obviously, still terrible, but discrepancy between the education that boys and girls get. So much progress on so many fronts, so many real challenges. Our response to all seems to be to overemphasize and cower behind the challenges rather than rise to meet them and to overlook the evidence that challenges can be overcome. We've made a lot of progress over the last 50 years in particular on so many fronts, but no one knows it. We, we know from the research that there's very, very low awareness of it. Yeah, I, I think that there's a problem here, which is that once safety uh, becomes a, a moral norm, once safety becomes a value in and of itself, and more importantly, once safety becomes a, a foundational value in Western society, and that's really what it has become, it has its own imperative. And once you begin to uh, sort of see safety as, as, as having this incredible intrinsic importance, and it's only a matter of time before you feel that you can never be safe enough. So that the meaning of safety yeah. expands from what are kind of quite sensible precautions that you need to take in order to protect yourself and your family to areas that beforehand were much more seen as, as open to exploration, to risk taking and to you know, experimentation. And I think it's interesting that uh, the concept of safe space which people used to laugh at. I remember giving lectures in different parts of Europe and talking about the danger of celebrating safe spaces and people telling me, you know, Frank, you're, you're exaggerating. This kind of fad for safe spaces will go away. 
you know, very, very swiftly. But that was eight, nine years ago. Today, the safe space idea has moved away from the university campus, where it was about one room. It then became the entire university had to be a safe space. And yeah. now in many companies, in many institutions, in parliaments, they talk about, the, you know, this is a safe space. And the idea that, you know, we have to create these safe spaces is really crucially important. It's far more important than people people grasp because if you believe that you need to have a space safe space, what you're really saying, in fact, is that everything outside of that safe space is potentially unsafe, and that's really the philosophical underpinning of, of, of the valuation of safety, where we assume that on balance, it's the absence of safety that determines our condition rather than anything else. So we don't realize that actually compared to any generation in, in human history, our lives are far safer in a physical and material sense than has been the case ever in the past. You know, this is the irony, you know, you know that you've said, I just quote it back to you again, I just think it is so well expressed. So long as Western society continues to deify safety, it will remain in thrall to the culture of fear. And nothing is more inhibiting, more soul-destroying than living in fear. One of the things that's really struck me during COVID in Australia, though, a little motto with these um, uh, the, behind the, the, the conversations that I hold is that you can't get good public policy out of a bad debate. If it's truncated, cut short, silenced, not followed through, not reason-based, if people can't ask questions, you won't get good policy and people won't own the policy outcomes. And we see all of that playing out in our country at the moment. And what struck me was the incredible emphasis on the health aspects of COVID and lockdowns and the measures being taken without, we've touched on this, the people being given uh, a proper and informed diagnosis or, 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 or information around the other issues, the mental health issues, the... Um, the University of Sydney has a, a medical unit that specialises uh, on uh, in um, uh, in suicide, and, and they were saying that the likely increase in suicides would be threefold amongst young people, massive across the nation, and outweigh deaths from COVID before Delta came along. It had almost no airplay, but for the people to make an informed decision about balancing things up and facing some tough realities and breaking fear free of the sort of fear that drives you to security. And then there's the economic side of it, the explosion of debt. We are paying our way through the crisis with our children's money. And those raw things are not put before people. So you're not getting this sort of, it's the end of the age of reason, I suppose, what I'm saying. You're not having a full picture put before adults, let alone children. Well, this relates to our earlier discussion because what's happened is that public health has become incredibly politicized in recent decades to the point at which public health is everything. I mean, every uh, aspect of our lives has got a public health uh, solution or, or a public health interest in it. And I think that what has happened is that uh, once public health becomes politicized, it becomes one of the major vehicles through which politics is conducted. And that's why I think what we've seen in the, in, during the COVID pandemic is a steady expansion of the role of public health in our lives so that it kind of pushes everything out of consideration. It, it is the only game in town in a sense and everything else from economic life to cultural life to young people's capacity to enjoy freedom in the outdoors, they all become subordinated and assessed from the point of view of public health. And I think that kind of uh, philosophical standpoint is really important because public health is really the medium to which uh, moral engineering and social engineering is most effectively conducted. Because what public health does, doesn't, it doesn't just simply make us feel healthy. It gives a, a, a set of values to us about what health is really all about. It becomes a, 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 a kind of a, an invisible way in which values and norms that have been recently constructed and created are circulated. And we're not aware of that because it's public health. Uh, that's the way it's really seen. But what we're doing is we're medicalizing our, our lives, social experience, to the point at which we become disinterested in real political, real economic issues. 
So, uh, you know, getting back to what you said earlier, you were warning and people are saying you were exaggerating about the dangers of safe spaces in universities. Then universities became safe spaces where you're not allowed to put a contrary view for fear of offending somebody, which challenges their very uh, feeling of, of safety and of well-being because we're, we confuse feeling with thinking. But in a sense, what we're now trying to do is to say to our governments, create a whole safe space uh, in the context of COVID. Exactly. And basically, that's another way of saying uh, you become mommy and daddy. You know, we're little children that need to be protected and insulated from the experience of everyday life. And that's the message that's come across, particularly in Australia. I think Australia is a very interesting and an extreme case, particularly for, for an outsider like me, because I remember when Australia uh, was defined by its robust can do attitude. I remember you know, my wife and I being you know, impressed and, and loving the attitude of Australians in the way they made their way in the world. And and then I remember coming back to Australia a little bit later and my wife and my son were on a bicycle uh, somewhere in Queensland and in, in a, on, a, on a golf course, just bicycling around. And the police car kind of pulls up and gives me a lecture, you, you know, that, you know, I'm not wearing a helmet. My wife's not wearing a helmet. We're still my son's not wearing a helmet and we're in a golf course you know there's no traffic there whatsoever and it really brought home to me how this safetyism this obsession with safety had become institutionalized so rapidly and so fast in australia that the old ways uh, are in danger of being sidelined that kind of robust can-do attitude i'm sure it's still there can become to some extent marginalized and i think we need to be aware of the way in which this kind of attitude towards safety ultimately diminish, diminishes the quality of our lives and diminishes the, the potential, the human potential that we have in, in being creative and, and transformative. Uh, and also gives us the, uh, if you like, the positive attitude, the energy to tackle the very real problems as opposed to the imagined problems. Uh, it's a little teller in the wind uh, in, in one of my recent conversations, um, uh, someone wrote in with a comment. I, I always read the comments. They're always very, very interesting and often very insightful. Uh, someone wrote in and said, whatever happened to the resilient, self-reliant, rugged Australian who went out there and had a go? And what was really interesting was it was flooded with likes. There's a very deep perception there that we, we are, we've become very soft. Maybe we've had it just too easy for too long. And part of the parcel is we now expect so much of government that it will break under its own weight. No one with a sense of proportion will ever take it on because they will be expected to be literally superhuman. Uh, and the problem with politicians is that, of course, they are not superhuman. They are human beings. We have turned government or we're turning it into God and then wondering why it lets us down. And I think that's very dangerous. It is. I think that uh, there are so many things in life that are best determined by common sense. So many uh, problems that we face that are can only be uh, sort of resolved by individuals who are directly affected by it. So many problems that are specific to a particular community, to a particular context. And if you now have this kind of template political attitude where you just pass a law to solve a problem, you end up creating as, as many problems as, as, you, as you're kind of solving. And I think the, to me, the, 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 the central uh, significance of democracy is, isn't that we just go out and vote once every four years or once every five years, but that we live democratically and we are making decisions about ourselves and our community. And we're developing a sense of strength by the fact that other people have been involved in that decision making along our side. And I think that kind of attitude is really crucial for uh, the democratic spirit to, to, to thrive and to flourish, because if we are merely the passive consumers of government policies rather than the actors who are influencing that policy, then we have a very different, potentially very undemocratic political system. And that, that is not something that we, we, can, we can put up with. And, and we must do everything that we can to challenge that. And fortunately, I'm sure there are enough robust Australians around still who, could, who can see what the problems are. They just need to make their voices heard a little bit louder. I do, I really believe that's right. I often make the point, I'll make it again, that I'm struck by how the, the best thinking, clearest thinking of our young people are 
they, they eclipse my generation. It's just that they've got a longer tail to deal with. Um, they're going to have to really sharpen up the differences and show some real courage. Look, uh, it's probably an ideal point to start to wind out of uh, these uh, brilliant remarks that you've made, but I can't help asking, you end your book with a clarion call on this very issue to educating our young people for independence rather than their current dependency on validation. Uh, what do you think that might look like? How, how do we encourage it? The practical question for all of those young people I was just talking about who say we've got to do this better. Um, how, how do we encourage it, uh, Frank? How do we how do we gear it up and and uh, be wise well elders? Not wanting to sound pompous about it, but your role is incredibly important. You write so powerfully on it. But we've got to give those people who can see what's going wrong the tools to start the fight back against some of the insidiousness that really is enveloping us? I don't know. One of the things I've been trying to do uh, in the last few years, especially before the lockdown when it was easier, is to talk, uh, talk with young people, go to different schools, and particularly talk to what I think is the most crucial age group between 16 and 18. Because at that point, they're still very idealistic. They've got a lot of energy. They take themselves very, very seriously. They haven't become cynical. They haven't learned to play the game in the way that they're meant to, uh, in accordance with the kind of uh, uh, questionable values that are in the air. And I think uh, it's important to challenge that group. Rather than validating them, our job as educators, as elders, is to inspire them by challenging them, by stretching them, by setting them tasks that is beyond them, but which, which, which will force them to in a sense, stand on their two feet and, 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 and begin to make things happen. I think these are things we can do as individuals, but the, the most important, uh, the most important challenge we face is how we alter the education system that exists in yeah. our society. I think the, the big battles of the future are in the schools. I think we have to, uh, in a sense, uh, bring back a form of education that uh, educates young people for independence rather than for dependence, that educates young people to take risks rather than to become risk averse. Uh, basically, that encourages children to believe that anything is possible if they make an effort. And most important of all, we have to teach them that whatever they do, you know, sort of can be allowed as long as they're prepared to live with the consequences. In other words, get them to understand that responsibility for their predicament is not just a, a negative phenomenon. Being responsible is potentially a very, very creative way of, uh, of understanding who you are, what you're all about, and, 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 and serving as a, as a point of contact for other people. So in, in that sense, you know, um, this is the, the key thing. And if there's one value I want to teach and educate and promote with the young, it's the value, it's the old Greek value of, of courage. I think courage is really important. Courage is often misunderstood and seen as being very masculine and very macho. But courage is actually about, in a sense, taking yourself seriously, doing something that is difficult, you know, that you have to really sweat about before you take that step. And even if for some reason or another, when you take that step, you slip, it doesn't really matter. Because by acting courageously, you become aware of something inside of you that gives you strength. And, uh, and the more we act courageously, the stronger we become in ourselves. And that's the best, most effective way of, of forging an alternative to this uh, uh, process of validating people psychologically. Uh, well, of course, it's the antithesis, isn't it, of, uh, of the thing that I was focusing on, the way we cow in the corner in fear and that you've written about so much. I'd, I'd tease it out a little bit more and test your response to this. Uh, I think it'd be great if they learnt uh, all four of the uh, sort of classic virtues. Because, you see, we now say virtues attached to a movement or an identity. And if you dare to oppose my identity, then you're not a virtuous person, but I am. That's fatal to my way of thinking. I think that's just a disaster. But what were the, 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 the Roman or classic or Aristotelian values you've mentioned? Courage, justice. Temperance and moderation, prudence, which is making wise decisions with the best available information. Um, and I would add to those, I can't help it, just to test your reaction. I don't think it would hurt to at least know what the Christian virtues were, love, faith and hope. 
they had a place as well. Uh, but they're not taught anymore. None of them are taught. I, I doubt whether the average Australian uh, school school uh, uh, attendee, a student, would have any idea of the classic or the Christian virtues because, you see, it's, it comes from the past so it must therefore be bad and shouldn't be taught. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, unfortunately, they're regarded as very old and anything that's old is is seen as being pasted. You know, sort of, I think that's, that's really, really sad. Uh, I, I'm even worried that uh, people who are religious, you know, who have uh, a religious faith, have also not been uh, explicitly uh, taught these kind of virtues. Very often you find that uh, in universities or in schools, religious education tends to be about something very, very different, tends to be about different psychological values rather than these very basic virtues that you've described. Um, my favorite virtue, by the way, to, uh, you know, if I could just explain, is, is the Aristotelian idea of phronesis, which is that of practical wisdom. And what that's really all about is the virtue of being able to make judgments and being prepared to make judgments, which is something that our society very much discourages and, and dismisses as being judgmental. And we're meant to be non-judgmental. But actually, it's when I judge you, you know, sort of John, that's the moment I take you seriously. If I'm not judging John Anderson, then I'm not really interested in what you're saying. I'm quite indifferent to what you're communicating. But when I judge you, when I kind of assess your comments as being good or bad, then I'm actually listening to you. And that's how human relationships are forged. That's how we become part of a public sphere where uh, we as democratic citizens are judging one another. And, and, and through that whole process, we give meaning and life to the to, to democracy itself. As long as we don't say in our judgment that because I disagree with you, you are worthless. That kills democracy once we become contemptuous of one another. But I, I can't help closing with, I mean, there you go. This must be your 25th or 26th book. I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, we're putting it up on the screen again. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it does strike me that very often it's people who have lived a lot, have accumulated a lot of experience, who actually have a much better understanding of what's coming to us than those young people who are going to live it. Uh, that's the wisdom of the ages. It's critically important. And Frank, thank you so much again for sharing your latest take. I, I just think it's invaluable. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.